available on YouTube and on the Archdiocesan social media. So keep an eye out for that probably tomorrow. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions this evening. And if you'd like to do that, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So during the talk, you can send in your questions. And what we'll do is we'll pick them up and try and answer as many as we can at the end of the talk. And then our schedule uh, for this evening. The talk will last about 40 minutes um, and we'll get going in a couple of minutes. We'll then have some Q&A before finishing prompt at 8.45. So I'd now like to welcome Mark Halliday Sutherland and his brother Neil. Mark is a corporate facilitator and an executive coach who lives with his wife and son in Sydney. He's a graduate of the Australian Graduate School of Management from where he has an MBA. And he's worked in banking, in financial services and investment in Australia and the UK. Mark was born in Singapore and spent his childhood in Brunei, in Hong Kong, Malaysia, the Philippine Islands and Yorkshire. He served for seven years in the Honourable Artillery Company and his articles have been published in the Catholic World Report and one Peter Five websites. He curates and writes articles for HallidaySutherland.com, which is a website celebrating the life and work of Dr Halliday Sutherland, who is the Scottish doctor in the title of this evening's talk. And Dr Sutherland is the paternal grandfather of tonight's speakers, Mark and Neil. And the book Exterminating Poverty is their first book and is available at exterminatingpovertybook.com. So I'd now like to ask Mark to unmute and to give us his talk. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Paul, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight I'm going to tell you about my grandfather, Halliday Sutherland, who is a Scottish doctor. He was born in 1882 in Glasgow and he died in 1960 in London. Dr. Sutherland is largely forgotten today. In his time, he was a recognized specialist in tuberculosis. He produced Britain's first public health cinema film in 1911. In the 1930s, he became internationally famous as the best-selling author of autobiographies. He was a contemporary of Belloc and of Chesterton. And indeed, it was Chesterton who, who described him as a born writer, especially a born storyteller. Dr. Sutherland, who is distinguished in medicine, is an amateur in the sense that he only writes when he has nothing better to do. But when he does, it could hardly be done better. If Dr. Sutherland is remembered today, it is as the defendant in the Stopes and Sutherland libel trial of 1923. The accepted history of that legal battle is summarized on the BBC's history website, which reads, in 1921, Stopes opened a family planning clinic in Holloway, North London, the first in the country. It offered a free service to married women and it gathered data about contraception. The Catholic Church was Stopes's fiercest critic. In 1923, Stopes sued Sutherland. Stopes sued Catholic doctor Halliday Sutherland for libel. She lost, won at appeal, and then lost again in the House of Lords. But the case generated huge publicity for Stopes's views. Stopes continued to campaign for women to have better access to birth control. Now, Anyone reading this story is likely to know that the Catholic Church forbids the use of artificial contraceptives. And in the absence of any other motivation given, they might go away with the impression that Dr. Sutherland was some sort of Catholic uh, activist or even some sort of religious zealot who attacked her clinic to please his religious masters. The Catholics Against Contraceptive Schema was started by Stopes herself, and her biographers have continued that narrative for the last 100 years. While it is at first sight persuasive, it leaves out so many relevant facts that I would argue that it is largely false. Importantly, Neil and myself used to believe that narrative about the trial, and no one, family or otherwise, told us differently. When I looked into the history, I, I, I found that, generally speaking, 
poor and working class women 100 years ago did not use contraceptives. They had large broods, extremely large by today's standards, and families of 10, 11, or 12 children were not unheard of. I often wondered why Halliday had attacked someone who had been presented to me as a kindly and charitable woman who was helping her poorer sisters. The chance discovery of his papers in 2013, when I literally stumbled and almost fell over uh, in my mother's cellar over a suitcase containing his papers, that started the project that led to the publication of our book, Exterminating Poverty, in August last year. In 2014, Neil and myself began to investigate why Halliday had had such an extreme reaction to Stopes. We read the biographies of Stopes and we traveled to see the source documents involved in the trial. These included the Catholic Archdiocese of Westminster's archive, as well as Stopes's papers in the British and Wellcome libraries in London. Uniquely, we had access to Dr. Sutherland's personal papers as well. Now, what we learned was that Dr. Sutherland was fighting eugenics, this pseudoscience that inspired some of the greatest crimes in history. We realized that if we as family members didn't know the truth, then it was highly unlikely that anybody else would. So we wrote Exterminating Poverty to correct the historical record. This presentation I'll give in three parts. In the first part, I'll give you some details about Dr. Sutherland's upbringing in Glasgow and in Edinburgh and the experiences that shaped the person he would later become. Then we'll talk about eugenics and how it related to tuberculosis. And then we'll talk about the case, the legal trial, the legal battle that started in 1922 and ended in the House of Lords in 1924. We will conclude by arguing that it is vitally important that this story is a lot better known today. Okay, so I'll begin with Dr. Sutherland's upbringing in Glasgow and in Edinburgh and the experiences that shaped the person he would become. Halliday was the oldest son of John Francis and Janie Sutherland. Janie, before she married, was Janie Mackay. This photograph shows the family in 1911. And standing from left to right is Joan, um, who's holding Wasp. Halliday standing in the middle, and on the right is Frank. Seated on the left is John Francis Sutherland, and on the right, Janie Sutherland. Lying at Joan's feet is Daddles. Halliday recalled his Glasgow childhood in his 1934 book, A Time to Keep. He wrote, Glasgow was a city of great fortunes and great poverty, each creating the other. Steam yachts at Rothsay, and in the streets around the Broomy Law, men in rags, women in shawls, shawlies they were called, and children barefooted. Good, mu good music in Kelvin Grove, and foul language in the Gallow Gate, where once people were hanged. The meaner streets were badly lit, and the closest that gave entrance to the tenement houses of the slums were often dark. At the street corners were the pubs, gin palaces, some called them and at night they shone with crystal lights. From these pubs, drunk men shambled even in daylight. At night, from the high street came the shouts of drunken men and the screams of women, two shawlies fighting. A crowd would watch them tearing each other's hair, rending their rotten cotton blouses and scratching on the face and breasts until policemen dragged them away, screaming. Another recollection of Halliday's childhood was the time that the Member of Parliament for St. Rollox, Sir James Carmichael, came to dinner. After dinner, Sir James, John Sutherland and one other guest visited the slums accompanied by a private detective. That evening, they saw things that made them weep. And so, for instance, Halliday recalled in parts of the city, um, they would string a padded rope across between two walls, say under a railway arch, and there for one penny a night, homeless men would sleep with their arms draped across the rope. These recollections show that Halliday saw poverty in Glasgow, albeit from a safe distance. 
At the age of 13, he was sent to Merxton Castle School in Edinburgh, which was then situated in and around the Napier Tower. From there, he attended Edinburgh University to study medicine. Now, I think it's fair to say that Halliday in his first year spent more time in playing hard rather than working hard. And he particularly enjoyed the debating society, um, drinking and high living. And there was at least one experiment with cannabis. This led to a crisis when at the end of his first year, he failed his anatomy exam. And without passing anatomy, he could not continue his studies. At this point, John Francis Sutherland sent him to Huelva in the southern point of Spain, which is where this photograph was taken. In Huelva, Janie's brother ran a successful medical practice. When Halliday returned to Scotland, his father told him to think about his future. He could, with the support of his father, continue his medical studies. However, he would have to work hard and he would have to apply himself. If he wasn't going to, then John suggested that he get himself a job and support himself with the money that he earned. From this point, Halliday turned things round and began to work hard. Shortly after he graduated, Halliday decided to specialize in tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis or TB was a huge problem in Britain at that time. Each year consumption, which is tuberculosis of the lungs, killed 50,000 people. A further 20,000 died of other forms of the disease and a further 150,000 were disabled. Tuberculosis was a disease of poverty and it affected the poor three times more than the wealthier classes. When the disease struck the breadwinner, whole families would be thrown into destitution. It was estimated that it was the cause of around 11% of pauperism in England and Wales. At this point, Halliday came under the influence of Sir Robert Philip, who created the international, internationally famous Edinburgh system for the prevention and cure of TB. Halliday in 1911 produced Britain's first public health cinema film, The Story of John McNeil. This is a still from the film. Now, you can see from this print that the film is in good condition today, and anybody who would like to view it can do so by visiting the British Film Institute's website and typing in a search for Halliday Sutherland or the story of John McNeil. In 1911, Halliday also became the medical director of the St. Marylebone Dispensary for the Prevention of Consumption. In this photograph, you can see the open air shelters that were provided to some of the tuberculous patients at the dispensary. From the dispensary, Halliday set up an open air school in a bandstand in Regent's Park. The school was for pre-tuberculous children. Now in this photograph, you can see the school on the left in 1911 and on the right in 1913. Note that the photograph in 1913 was taken in December. So if you thought your school days were spent in cold classrooms, check this place out. Despite the cold and despite the fact it operated right round the world, uh, right round the year, however, it should be noted that none of the children became sicker. They only improved in health. This photograph shows Halliday in 1911. And we're going to end this section with the devastating blow that struck him at this point in his life. Just at the time when he began to make some sound achievements in his medical career, his father, John, died suddenly and unexpectedly in Christmas in 1912. He was aged 57. Okay, so we're now going to turn to eugenics. What I'll do is I will give you some background, I'll give you a definition, and then I'll explain how eugenics caused controversy in medical circles, particularly as it related to tuberculosis. In its modern form, eugenics was founded by Sir Francis Galton, the cousin of Charles Darwin. In this photograph, Galton is seen sitting on the right. Don't worry about the other chap, we'll come to him in a moment. Galton had seen that the selective breeding of animals 
on farms had produced the spe best specimens. And he wondered, could that be applied to men? Could a race of men be similarly improved? Now, Galton was a brilliant statistician, and his insight was that if you combine biometrics with statistical measures, statistical methods, sorry, you'd be able to reveal the relative influence of nature and nurture in shaping an individual human being. He coined the term eugenics for his new science, which he said was the study of agencies under social control that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. The problem that kept eugenicists awake at night was something that they called the differential birth rate. This was to do with the fact that the birth rate in Britain had been falling from the mid 1880s onwards. The fall was not, however, represented evenly across all social classes. And so while middle class and wealthier classes were having smaller families, the poor and working classes were not. To the eugenic mind, this meant that Britain was selectively breeding from the people that eugenicists regarded as the worst stocks. Over one half of the next generation was being produced by the lowest quarter in British society. For this reason, eugenicists fretted about racial degeneration or even race suicide. As we saw in the last section, TB was a huge problem that particularly afflicted the poor. The key question for eugenicists was whether consumption, was it caused primarily by infection or was it caused by heredity? Well, one person who thought he knew the answer was Carl Pearson, seen in this photograph sitting on uh, sitting to the left of Galton. Pearson was Galton's protege, and he was the first professor of eugenics at London University. He said that when it came to TB, heredity was significantly more important than infection by at least a factor of 10 to one. If you wanted to reduce the death rate from TB, he said, you'd need to aid nature's method. He said, the bulk of the tuberculous belonged to stocks that we want to discourage, everything which tends to check the multiplication of the unfit, to emphasize the fertility of the physically and ment mentally healthy, will aid nature's method of reducing the death rate from TB. That is what the eugenicist proclaims as the better thing to do. Members of the medical establishment agreed with him. Sir James Barr, president of the British Medical Association, gave the presidential speech at the BMA's 1912 conference. And this, he said, if we could only abolish the tubercle bacillus in these islands, we would get rid of tuberculous disease. But we would at the same time raise up a race particularly susceptible to this infection, a race of hothouse plants, which would not flourish in any other environment. Nature, on the other hand, weeds out those who have not got the innate power of recovery from disease. And by means of the tubercle bacillus and other pathogenic organisms, she frequently does this before reproductive age, so that a check is put on the multiplication of idiots and the feeble-minded. Nature's methods are thus of advantage to the race rather than to the individual. Dr. Sutherland's view was that consumption was caused primarily by infection. The opening caption of his 1911 film, The Story of John McNeil, stated that if tuberculosis was caught early enough, it was curable, and that up to then, it was preventable. Shortly after Barr's speech, Dr. Sutherland rebutted Barr's views on medical and scientific grounds in an article in the British Medical Journal. The First World War heightened eugenic anxiety for two reasons. Firstly, recruiting officers for the armed forces revealed the shockingly poor physical condition and mental state of men in Britain's industrial cities. The second reason was that the war was considered dysgenic, because while eugenically fit men, military classification A1, were being sent off to fight and were being killed, the unfit, military classification C3, remained safe at home. Towards the end of the war, 
you can see the intensification of the debate between heredity or infection. In September 1917, Sutherland made a speech, Consumption, Its Cause and Cure. In this, he said that the means to cure consumption and tuberculosis was within easy reach, but he said that the cure of the disease was being hampered by eugenicists. He said, there are some self-styled eugenicists, race breeders with the souls of cattle breeders, who declaim that the prevention of disease is not in itself a good thing. They say the efficiency of the state is based upon what they call the survival of the fittest. This war has smashed their rhetorical phrase. Who now talks about survival of the fittest or thinks himself fit because he survives? I don't know what they mean. I do know that in preventing disease, you are not preserving the weak, but conserving the strong. And I do know that in those evil conditions which will kill a weakly child with a few months of birth and slay another when he reaches the teens will destroy yet another when he comes to adult life. One year later in September 1918, Sir James Barr made a speech on the future of the medical profession. He said, the death rate amongst idiots is around 10 times that of the normal population at the same age further of deaths of idiots, around 80% are due to tuberculosis. There are some 150,000 estimated of these defectives in England and Wales, and for every defective, there are from six to a dozen of his relatives who are only a shade better than himself. Until we have some restriction in the marriage of undesirables, the elimination of the tubercle bacillus is not worth aiming at. It forms a rough but on the whole, very serviceable check on the survival and propagation of the unfit. Personally, I am of the opinion that if tomorrow the tubercle bacillus were non-existent, it would be nothing short of a national calamity. We are not yet ready for its disappearance. In 1921, Barr's prayers for a restriction in the marriage of undesirables were answered, and we're going to deal with this in the third part of this talk. In this third section, we're going to look at the Stopes and Sutherland libel trial of 1923. Firstly, we're going to look at the background that led to the case. We're going to look at the background of Dr. Stopes, her opening of the Mother's Clinic in 1921, how she came to sue Dr. Sutherland and how the case played out. This photograph shows Dr. Sutherland in 1920, and I'm going to use this point to pause and to say something about his religious beliefs. This is important because, as I've already said, the case has been represented by the biographers of Stopes as Catholics against contraceptives. Dr. Sutherland was baptized a Presbyterian and was in the early 1900s an agnostic in belief and an atheist in practice. On the eve of the First World War, he joined the Church of Scotland. It was not until 1919, shortly before he married my grandmother, Muriel Fitzpatrick, an Irish Catholic, that he was accepted into the Catholic Church. Now, this chronology makes it clear that Sutherland opposed eugenics long before he became a Catholic. And so it's more accurate to say that he was attracted to the church because of its longstanding opposition to eugenics, rather than he opposed Stopes and eugenics because he was a Catholic. Now let's turn to Dr. Stopes. Dr. Marie Carmichael Stopes was born in Edinburgh in 1880. Academically bright, she made a name for herself as a paleobotanist and made important discoveries in the classification of coal. While she was well qualified and entitled to use the title doctor, it should be noted that she was a doctor of science, not of medicine. Now Stopes is remembered today as the woman who gave other women reproductive choice, so this should be clarified. With the exception of the contraceptive pill, there was no contraceptive device available today that was not already available in 1900 and back then in greater variety. What Stopes, what Stopes did was to make contraception available to the women 
who are least likely to use them. In other words, poor and working class women. Stopes was a member of the Malthusian League and she joined the Eugenics Education Society in 1912. Malthusians had long been associated with contraceptives and indeed contraceptives were sometimes known as uh, Malthusian devices. Stopes tried to get the Eugenic Society to promote contraception, but they refused. So what she did in 1921 was, with her husband Humphrey Rowe, she opened her own mother's clinic for constructive birth control at 61 Marlborough Road in Holloway. From here, women were provided with contraceptives free of charge at cost and also were instructed in their use. Now, the Mother's Clinic is always presented as Britain's first family planning clinic. I think it went a lot further than what you and I would understand as family planning. I would argue that it was the first step in the implementation of eugenic breeding in Britain. You see, firstly, there's the name of the society shown in the top left-hand corner of the slide. It was called the Society for Constructive Birth Control and Racial Progress. Underneath is tenets 9 and 16 of the Society for Constructive Birth Control and Racial Progress's manifesto. Tenet 9 reads as follows. We say that there are unfortunately many men and women who should be prevented from procreating children at all because of their individual ill health or the diseased and degenerate nature of the offspring that they may be expected to produce. These considerations would not apply to a better and healthier world. Under that, Tenet 16 confirms that they were a pro-baby organization. Well, nothing controversial there. But then you read, it is just as much the aim of constructive birth control to secure conception to those married people who are healthy, childless, and who desire children, as it is to furnish security from those who are racially diseased, already overburdened with children, or are in any specific way unfitted for parenthood. Now note that racially diseased included infectious diseases such as tuberculosis. Note too that Stopes's definition of the people who were unfitted for parenthood was very, very broad. Um, indeed, Zoe Williams, a columnist of The Guardian, um, described her categorization of people unfitted for parenthood as slightly to the right of Hitler's. Now, Zoe, Zoe Williams is not known as being an anti-feminist or anti-contraception uh, writer. Stopes also used very unscientific language to describe those she wanted to eliminate, on, on, on occasions describing them as the spawn of drunkards or hordes of defectives. On the top right hand side of the slide, you see the logo for the clinic and the slogan, joyous and deliberate motherhood, a sure light on our racial darkness. Under that, on the bottom right, you see photographs of the contraceptives dispensed at Stopes's clinic. The brand names were her own choice, pro-race and racial brand. So if you're seeing a bit of a theme emerging here, it's because there was one. While this was not the restriction in the marriage of undesirables that Sir James Barr had been looking for, it did mean that were undesirables to marry, they would be having a lot fewer children. He wrote to congratulate Stopes on the 26th of March, 1921. In his letter, he said, you and your husband have inaugurated a great movement, which I hope, which I hope will eventually get rid of our C3 population and exterminate poverty. The only way to raise an A1 population is to breed them. Barr became vice president of Stopes' society shortly afterwards. While Stopes provided contraceptives to the poor women who wanted them and who went to the clinic, she advocated compulsory sterilization for the C3 mothers who did not. She lobbied politicians, including Prime Minister Lloyd George, for laws to enable the state to do this. So for all the talk about Stopes giving women choice, had the laws for compulsory sterilization that she lobbied for been passed, 
In the case of those she described as the C3 women, that choice would have been made by the state. In July 1921, Dr. Sutherland attended a talk at the Medico Legal Society in London. There he saw Professor Louise McKilroy, a distinguished physician and the first professor of gynecology at London University, speak on birth control. He also heard McKilroy describe the cervical cap, the contraceptive in use at Stopes's clinic, as the most dangerous of which she had had experience. Sutherland then wrote a Catholic Truth Society pamphlet called Do Babies Build Slums? He later expanded this in a, into a book which was published in 1922. The book's title was Birth Control, a statement of the Neo-Malthusians against the, sorry, Birth Control, a statement of Christian doctrine against the Neo-Malthusians. In it, under a section entitled exposing for the, the poor to experiment, he wrote, secondly, the ordinary decent instincts of the poor are against these practices, and indeed they have used them less than any other class. But owing to their poverty, lack of learning and helplessness, the poor are the natural victims of those who seek to make experiments on their fellows. In the midst of a London slum, a woman who is a, who is a doctor of German philosophy Munich has opened a birth control clinic where working women are instructed in a method of contraception described by Professor McIlroy as the most harmful of which I have had experience. It is truly amazing that this monstrous campaign of birth control should be tolerated by the Home Secretary. Charles Bradlaugh was condemned to jail for a less serious crime. Now these words led Stopes to Sue Sutherland, and so they are frequently cited in the, or the biographies of Stopes. I have never seen any reference to the words that followed in Sutherland's paragraph, sorry, the paragraph that followed in Sutherland's book. In it, he said that if eugenic breeding was implemented in Britain, and if children were forbidden to the poor as the privilege of the rich, then the, world, then the poor would have no role in society other than as workers. Britain, he said, would become a servile state. When Sutherland received the writ, he had no money to fight the case, and a journalist friend contacted the Westminster Archdiocese. Shortly afterwards, Sutherland received a message. Cardinal Bourne will support you to the end. In addition to moral leadership, Bourne contributed £500 of his personal funds. While raising money for the legal battle was a fight, collections were held in Sunday masses all over the country to raise money for the battle. The case opened on the 21st of February 1923. It took five and a half sitting days to resolve. Eminent physicians testified on both sides, including Barr for Stopes and McIlroy for Sutherland. Sutherland won in the High Court. He, learned, he then lost on appeal. He appealed to the House of Lords and then won conclusively in November 1924. I'll end this talk by asking, does this matter today? And I would argue that yes, it does. And I would argue also that it's very, very important that this story is widely known. In 2015, while researching this book, Neil and myself met Anne Farmer, a historian and an author. We discussed the eugenicists of 100 years ago, and we compared them to their equivalent. Now, Anne then said that she'd rather deal with the eugenicists of 100 years ago than, of, than with the ones today. And that surprised me, so I asked her why. She said that the eugenicists of 100 years ago openly stated their agenda, whereas the eugenicists of today conceal their hand. Indeed, the concealment has been so successful that many people are under the impression that eugenics somehow ceased to exist after 1945. It didn't. In 1958, Stopes died and she left her, her clinic 
to the eugenic society. At around this time, the society faced an existential crisis because its membership had dropped by around one half compared to the numbers in the 1930s. It was at this point in 1960 that the society adopted a policy of crypto eugenics. Now, let's be clear about that. Crypto is the Greek for hidden or secret. So what they're going to do is they're going to secretly advocate and push for eugenics. They're going to continue their work, but they're not going to tell you why they're doing it. Subse subsequent events were in keeping with this policy. So in 1968, you see the society ceased publication of the Eugenics Review, and they replaced it with the innocuously named Journal of Biosocial Science. Then in 1975, the society sold Stopes's Whitfield Street Clinic to Dr. Tim Black. He then founded Marie Stopes International. In 1989, the Eugenics Society changed its name to the less evocative Galton Institute, and that's the name by which it is known today. Nonetheless, the work of the Malthusians and the eugenicists continued. Anne Farmer herself wrote a book called By Their Fruits, in which she showed how eugenicists were behind the push for abortion reform in the 1950s and 1960s, and which led to the 1968 Abortion Act. Today, Marie Stopes International, re recently renamed MSI Reproductive Choices, facilitates around 5 million abortions around the world each year. You see, the fact is the eugenicists and Malthusians never stopped. They merely changed their appearance to give the impression that they no longer existed. And if you were under that impression, well, they did a good job, didn't they? The story of Dr. Sutherland's fight against Stopes and against eugenics will inform those and inspire those who are fighting the evils of eugenics and Malthusianism today. And it'll also show that their campaign has gone on for at least the last 100 years, if not for longer. The next reason I think it matters is that when we see the proliferation of contraceptives and abortion, many people, including many Catholics, believe that they lost the historical argument. But in the sense that Catholics accurately foretold what would happen in the future, they didn't. So for instance, we see Dr. Sutherland in 1922 writing, our declining birth rate is a fact of the utmost gravity, and a more serious position has never confronted the British people. Here, in the midst of a great nation, at the end of a victorious war, the law of decline is working, and by that law, the greatest empires of the world have perished. In comparison with that single fact, all other dangers, be they of war, of politics, or of disease, are of little moment. Let us have children, children at any price, will be the cry of tomorrow. The Catholic Church has never taught that an avalanche of children should be brought into the world regardless of the consequences. God is not mocked. As men sow, so shall they reap. There is only one civilization immune from decay, and that civilization endures on the practical eugenics once taught by a united Christendom, and now expounded almost solely by the Catholic Church. In 1929, Dr. Sutherland foretold the future of Europe when he wrote, the cataclysm which may end the eighth known epoch in civilization may be a lack of European children. The final reason that I think this story is important today is because, as I said at the beginning, Neil and myself used to believe the Catholics against contraceptive summary of the case. As I said, no one, family or otherwise, told us differently. If family don't know, then no one else does. The centenaries of the events in this story have occurred and will occur in the next few years. This is an opportunity to present the little-known facts of Dr. Sutherland's fight against eugenics 100 years ago. It's an opportunity 
to remember that the Catholic Church was and is on the right side of history in this long-running battle between those who celebrate life and the population controllers who seek to curtail, limit, reduce, and to destroy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'd like to just thank you there for an extremely informative and I think encouraging talk as well. So we'll now go on thank to um, some questions. Uh, just a reminder that you can fire in questions using the Q&A function, which is down the bottom of your screen. And during the questions, Mark will be joined by his brother, Neil. Uh, and I'd just like to invite Neil now, if you'd like to unmute um, and turn on his video so that he can join us. Welcome, Neil. Hello. And I didn't say, of course, that Mark, Mark today, you may have guessed, Mark is uh, getting up very early in Australia to do this for us. And, and we're extremely grateful for, for his uh, extraordinary time uh, on, on this. And, and Neil, you're in uh, near the New Forest, I believe. That's right. I'm between Salisbury and Southampton. Fantastic. Well, uh, just a, a quick question, because you've mentioned the book a couple of times. What's the best place uh, to get hold of the book? It's available on Amazon, um, or if you go to www.exterminatingpovertybook.com, you'll be able to get details of where to get it there. Fantastic. And hallidaysutherland.com is the, the website that you curate with, with if people want to read much wider about um, Halliday Sutherland, that would be the best website for them? That's right. Um, the, I'll explain the purpose that the purpose of the site was that when I started it in 2014, there was no information about Halliday on well, pretty much no information about Halliday on the Internet. And what there was was generally written by um, the biographers and disciples of Stopes. Um, I set up the website to even up the balance. Um, I take extracts from his best-selling books, Archers the Years, A Time to Keep, and others. And so if you want to go on there to read, for instance, um, his childhood recollections in Glasgow and in Edinburgh, or even with his experiment with it, um, cannabis, it's all on the site. Um, the other thing about the site is what I used it for was while researching the book to write articles, to hone my writing skills, and to embed the citations to remind myself of where they were. Right. Excellent. I'm sure that'd be a great resource. So uh, just having a look at the questions uh, coming in there, um, a question, do you know of any documentary makers who have showed an interest in terming the book or a TV program? Uh, into something, just just spread the, 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 the life and, and the case of Dr. Sutherland more widely. I'm working on it, uh, so not yet. Um, there was a, in 1972, um, on the BBC, there was a documentary slash drama, um, but I think it was very much from the accepted history uh, of the Stopes trial. And so it was called Marie Stopes and the Sexual Revolution. Um, but no, I'm not aware of any documentary or drama or feature film made about the trial. Okay. Great. And I know, um, Neil, I know we were talking earlier, you, you, you visit to Edin uh, Edinburgh now and again, um, and I think you're familiar with some of the sites and the, and the places that, that Mark was talking about. Yes, that's right. I'm, unfortunately, my job um, it takes me up to Edinburgh from time to time. So in a pandemic free world, I normally get up there about two or three times a year. But when I'm up there, I'm, I tend to read a section of one of the books that he wrote in the past and pop along to places that he um, went to. So for example, in Collinson Road, um, if you go to Napier University, you'll see the, the stone tower at the, at the front, which is built in the 15th century in which um, John Napier, um, invented logarithms before the use of um, before the use of calculators and um, I then found out that Halliday's dormitory that, that sorry that stone tower used to be part of Murchiston school the old school at Murchiston and um, so yeah he he was in he had a dormitory with two other boys in the stone tower but there, there's also the the Victoria Hospital in Craigleith off Craigleith Road where with Dr. Robert Phillip, they developed the internationally renowned Edinburgh system. 
and then popping down to um, where is it, New Haven and um, Granton. There used to be an old chain pier which blew down in a storm in the eight, late 1890s. Um, the only thing that remains of it today is an old, um, the old booking office, which has been turned into a pub. And um, when I went there, I found out that there was quite a, a famous um, landlady called Betty Moss, who, who used to um, call orders, last orders, by firing um, a starting pistol. And, um, and, and also had shrunken heads festooned around it. It's, it's a pretty good pub too. And other things that in 1909, 1809, when, uh, sorry, 1909, during the Edinburgh University rectories, you can follow the procession that he led from uh, the mound through the top of the high street, along the George IV Bridge, through the Lothian Street to Drummond Street, where he is one of the Whigs debating societies laid into the Tories' um, side of the debating society. And, and that caused a bit of a riot. And they, they're quite tame these days. Yeah, so, so lots to do when I'm up there, which um, is always a great reason to get up there more. Yes. And I, I found out during this, uh, when researching this talk, Edinburgh actually has a blue plaque to Mary Stoops at uh, Abercrombie Place. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you have a view on whether such things would be up or perhaps more positively, maybe we should put one up to um, Dr. Dr. Sutherland as well. I mean, the thing is, the moment is, it's, I mean, Mark and I, you know, set out from the beginning that we're really not for cancel culture or statue tumbling, because I think, I think plaques give you an idea of the background to our past, which is important to keep, you know, to keep up there. Um, but certainly, you know, at the moment, you've got University College London, which is changing um, the Galton building into something more respectable. Um, you've got the MSI international name change or MSI reproductive choices and expect to see the full rebranding eventually. They'll just drop the MSI and um, it'll just be called reproductive choices. Um, so, yeah, so it, it, it'd be good to have a plaque up somewhere. I haven't checked I... on Robert Phillip. There should be. Imagine. Could I add to that too, that at the beginning of the project um, or before the beginning of the project, I was aware that Halliday was well known in his time, that he met heads of state from time to time, and I knew he was famous in his lifetime. Now, while I was interested in that, I didn't have any idea of writing a book because I just thought, well, are you just really bigging up your grandfather, thinking he's more important than he actually was because you're so close to it, because you're in this bubble. And so um, I didn't actually set out to get blue plaques everywhere or whatever. I thought, get on with my own life. He lived a good life. Let you get on with your own one. It was as I looked into it that I thought the historical record had been so unfair and pretty nasty about him that I thought it had to be created, uh, sorry, it had to be corrected. Now, if that did lead to blue plaques, such as on the family home at uh, five, where the family used to live at uh, five Stafford Terrace in Kensington, or the family homes in Edinburgh, or the Royal Dispensary um, for tuberculosis, I think that would be brilliant, yes. So, okay, I'm, I'm gonna combine two questions. Um, one is, um, was Jay, uh, did Dr. Sutherland uh, know or was he influenced by G.K. Chesterton at the time? Um, and also um, a question from Anne about racism. Racism is very much in the news at the moment. Um, and do you think that might just help draw attention to Stokes racism and anti-Semitism with, with, you know, her obsession with, with getting rid of the, the, or the poor or the C3s, as she called them? Can I answer the second question first? Of course. Okay. Um, I think the awareness of racism is helpful in one sense that people sort of say, look, this is unacceptable behavior. I think it's also unacceptable. Uh, sorry, it's unhelpful in the sense, though, that it's very much skin color, black, white racism. And back in Stopes and Sutherland's time, um, you know, the, there was a strong racial hatred, as it were, from people like Stopes to sort of people like the Irish. They were considered to be of a different breed, a different tribe. And so the thing is, if you look at the black-white, it's really framing it the wrong way. Um, 
so the thing is, is that it is useful because it's unacceptable, but eugenics in modern parlance was racism by white people on other white people and very much about taking the other and denigrating the other and labeling them and eventually eliminating them if you can. Um, certainly, as we see from tuberculosis, you can see the sort of blends of the labeling of the other when they see the people, the C3s with tuberculosis. And I don't think Sir James Barr, when he was head of the British Medical Association, would have been on the phone um, to the Minister for Health every single day complaining about the deaths from tuberculosis. I just don't think that happened. The answer of Chesterton, Neil, do you want to take that one? Um, not, well, the, 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 um, no, if you if you carry on. <laughs> okay, okay. There, there was just family law that um, Halliday dined with Chesterton at the Cafe Royal in London. Now, how many times that happened in family law? You know, it was like, oh, it happened the whole time, you know, and stuff like that. So I suspect it happened once or twice. But certainly, um, he was aware of and corresponded with Chesterton. And certainly, he was aware of and corresponded with Belloc as well. Um, and he used to exchange first editions uh, with Belloc, which given the prolific rate at which Belloc knocked out books compared to Halliday's, um, uh, I think Halliday had the better advantage there. And I also think um, Bell Belloc was a convert, wasn't he? And, and so- As was Chesterton. Yeah, okay, but in the book, um, In My Path, that was um, a book that Halliday said should be read annually by everybody. And a part had Rome. a big influence on him, the path to Rome. Yeah. Yeah. And basically, um, that probably helped him along the way in his own conversion. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, do you know where I can find out more on the eugenicist move to crypto eugenics? Or could you say a bit more about that? So that perhaps the modern manifestation of, of the eugenics movement? Um, well, the reference to crypto eugenics um, was in the eugenics review in an article by Schenk and Parks. I think it's A.S. Parks. So Schenk is S-H-E-N-K and Parks is P-A-R-K-E-S. And they wrote an article, I think it was in 1968, September of the eugenics review called The Future of the Eugenics Society. Now, they, they didn't envisage, fair enough, the internet age in which people like myself and others would get hold of this information. And that's where they wrote about the council's ad adopting of the um, crypto eugenics policy. If I could also add one other thing about that. Um, they adopted the policy in 1960, and I'm asserting that doing things in 1975 or later were in accordance with that policy, and I think that they were. I don't think in 1975 the Eugenic Society were looking, you know, back and, oh, we have to adhere to this policy, but I think that they learned very, very quickly that if they wanted an easy life without controversy, without being associated with the war crimes of the Third Reich, that mm -hmm. crypto eugenics was the go. I, I'd also add, add there is that actually when we first started the project, we felt it really important um, not to throw in our own opinions or ideas of what we thought the case was about or in, in answer to that question Mark has answered. Um, and therefore, a lot of, in, in the way that Mark has um, quoted Shanks and Parks, he, he, we're actually using their own words in exactly the same way is that when we cover the story about Stopes in the book, we're working on primary source evidence. Um, and in the, most of the court trial was actually an authorized transcript of the trial by Marie Stopes. And she actually corrected some of the transcript and then wrote it for approval. So all the, the arguments that we make are the words of the people who said them or wrote them at that time. And at the end of the day, we just say, there's, there's the factual evidence, um, you make the choice. Excellent. Um, next question, no, it's not so much a question, but a comment. Um, one of our listeners uh, works at the Astley Ainsley Hospital in Edinburgh. And she says there's actually a Sutherland Ward 
there. I don't know if you knew that. Would that be named after Dr. Halliday? I don't know. And thank you for letting me know. I don't know. That's some research down the track. Yep. <laughs> maybe maybe for Neil's next trip to Edinburgh. <laughs> well, yeah, I always remember a trip with my father to Dunedin in New Zealand, and he thought he'd look up a few Sutherlands because apparently some of the family had gone down that way after the clearances. <laughs> and um, when he looked it up, it was rather like Smith in the UK, um, where you get a directory within a directory of Sutherland. So I think um, certainly in Scotland, there's there's a good many um, Sutherlands that uh, we'd like to think were named after him, but as Mark says, we'll have to go and do some research. Maybe next time I'm up. Or maybe um, Therese, who asked that question and works at the hospital, could do a bit of local research. And um, if, if Therese, if you contact the pro-life office, we can put you in touch with Mark and Neil, and uh, that that might help. That would be great. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, Lady asking just a little bit about Dr. Halliday's personal history. When, when did he die? How many children did he have? And did he continue to practice uh, after the trial? Um, he died in 1960 in St. Uh, um, John's Wood, the hospital in St. John's Wood. Um, he did practice after the trial. Um, uh, he took some time out because it was a big strain both on him and on Stopes. It was very, very acrimonious. Um, he did various things such as, uh, I think in the early 30s or 40s, he set up a center for radiography um, in Birmingham, for example. So he continued to work within the national health system as a doctor and a tuberculosis specialist. From 1933 onwards, he became um, better known as an author and a sort of public speaker as well. And so, for instance, um, 33 was the publication of his first autobiography, Archers of the Years, which was followed in 1934 by A Time to Keep. Um, and from that stage, I'm not really sure how he balanced his medical career with his public speaking and things like that, um, because it was quite extensive. So in, for instance, in 1939, when war broke out, he was on his way to Australia for what was then the biggest speaking tour by an author in Australia, where he went all around um, the country um, addressing crowds and things like that. And so I'm not sure how he balanced his yeah, and as far as children, he, his, he, he had a, an elder daughter called Jane, and then followed by twins, Peter and John. Then um, Vincent was born. Vincent was um, killed um, on his first mission with Bomber Command um, in the Second World War, followed by my father, um, Ian Francis Sutherland, and then uh, the youngest, um, Richard Sutherland, um, who became a priest. He was a diocesan priest at the Westminster Archdiocese. So he, he, did, a, he did have a, a brood. <laughs> and all that fabulous support from the diocese was, was well rewarded if they, they gave back a priest a vocation. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. I think we've just got time for one more question. There, there are more questions coming in. I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours, but... Um, the question uh, Brian asks, uh, we now offer prenatal screening to all pregnancies, and this often results in abortions when conditions such as Down syndrome are identified. And do you know if the eugenics lobby has any influence in this, perhaps? Uh, I mean, it, it was one of the grounds of the Abortion Act, and, and is screening has become more prevalent and more effective in the last few years. The thing is, is that if you ask me for a document or a decision, I couldn't tell you what it was. I do know that that ideology is behind it. Um, and there are people in public life who are Malthusians and eugenicists. I'll give you, the thing is now, it's all clothed as science these days. Um, and I'll give you an example. In February, 2020, um, yeah, February 2020, remember there was the scandal over Andrew Subisky, and he was an advisor in Dominic Cummins' team at 
number 10. Mm -hmm. And it was asserted that he had eugenics views and it expressed these online. So he was kicked out, he had to go. Now around that time, um, published in the Daily Telegraph, there was an article by a geneticist um, at University College in London. And in this article about Sabisky, he, he said, look, Sabisky thinks this and that by any other name is eugenics. And he starts sort of, you know, this is, you think, oh, that's terrible. You know, this geneticist at UCL is completely in a different ballpark. If you read on in the article, what you learn is the reason this geneticist is having a go at Sabisky is he's saying, listen, you idiot, we can't select for intelligence. Um, but we can select for these other conditions and we can eliminate those. Now, of course, he didn't use the term eliminate, but that's basically what they're about. And so, yes, these things, and since you know the whole movement of crypto eugenics, um, the people who oppose these things are just taught, ah, oh, look, in the last few years or in the last couple of months, these people want to do this, we have to fight it. And one of the things I really want to get out in the book is no, this has been an operation and a plan. Um, sorry, that sounds too conspiratorial. There have been people who have believed in Malthusianism since T.R. Malthus in the 1700s. And they have led to disastrous consequences, such as the Irish famine, for instance, um, where very little or nothing was done to feed the Irish when they were starving. All the food continued to be exported from Ireland. And some people sort of shrugged their shoulders and said, look, that's the iron law of Malthus. There's nothing we can do. Um, likewise, with eugenics, that continues to this day. The ideologies live on, and I think people need to be aware of it. It's not just instance in current affairs in the news. It's a long-term plan. Yeah. Excellent. Well, well, thank you. That's all we have time for. So I will just say um, thank you so much to Mark. Uh, thank you very much. Talk, and to Neil for the contributions. Um, I've read the book. I highly recommend it. It was, a, it was an excellent, fascinating book. Um, and it's available, remember, it's just Exterminating Poverty by Mark and Neil Sutherland, and Amazon and all good online sellers will be able to uh, supply it for you. So again, just thank you to Mark and Neil. Can I also say thank you to Matt, who's been in the background this evening, has just helped us with the questions and the slides, made everything run quite smoothly. Thank you to all of you um, for your participation. A lot of nice comments coming in, so I, I think this has been enjoyed and um, there's even actually I'll send it on to you Mark there's an invitation for another talk elsewhere so um, thank def you definitely worth repeating but for now everybody thank you very much for this evening and we'll see you next time bye bye thank you Paul thank you Paul thank you Matt